welcome back to Light the Fuse. We are here with a very exciting two-part episode, but before we get into that, we want to talk a little bit about some news that broke, right, Charles? Yeah, um, Isai Morales has been cast in Mission Impossible 7 and 8. Uh, Christopher McQuarrie put uh, put it on Instagram and, and Twitter, did a little uh, black, nice black and white photo, and uh, we're, we're excited. You know, McQuarrie didn't say this, but the trades, I think, were saying that he is replacing Nicholas Holt. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't. We haven't gotten any confirmation on this, um, but that's what it appears to be. And they're blaming scheduling conflicts, which I don't really understand, considering no one is working right now. Right. So I don't really know what that's about, but uh, that's the story right now. I mean, it's possible maybe Nicholas Holt had something lined up for twenty twenty two or something, and now that this because this production is going to go forever. And so now maybe that that's bumped, he's going to hold on to that. Or, or I don't know, maybe they're planning to shoot soon and Nicholas Holt wasn't, uh, maybe he didn't want to travel or something. I, I don't, I mean, who, who knows? It also, we don't even know if he is replacing Nicholas Holt until we hear it from McCory that I just don't even know. I mean, it could have even been, a, it could be a story reason. Maybe they felt like that character shouldn't be a young guy anymore. Right. I'm just struck by how much Isai Morales looks like McCory in that photo. <laughs> <laughs> they look a lot alike. I love him. He's great. I'm very excited about about this, and I'm excited about the energy that he'll bring. I mean, all the different, all these actors are so different um, that it's going to be really interesting to see how they work together and how they work within the story, whatever that story may be. So, yeah, yeah, totally. I'm excited. Uh, well, so let's introduce uh, Mitchell Lieb. So you you knew Mitchell. You'd interviewed him before about uh, about Tron Legacy, right? And Daft Punk's music for Tron Legacy. Yes. Which uh, he gets into. He tells us some nice stories about that uh, in in next week's episode. But uh, it was yes. this was a, this was a crazy interview. This is one of our craziest interviews, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, here's the story. The story about Mitchell is that Mitchell is the head of Walt Disney Records, uh, which is obviously Disney's record label. And I was working at Disney and I said, oh, let's do a story about about Tron. And I had, I think, put 30 minutes on his calendar. And so I had put 30 minutes on my calendar. And then I went into his office and I think we talked for three and a half hours. (laughs) So I came back to my office and everyone was like, where were you? And um, but. I think the piece turned out really well, and um, he, you know, he says the boys, who is what he calls Daft Punk, the boys liked it, so that was that was very nice to hear. But um, yeah, Mitchell is like an old school Hollywood guy. He has great stories about everyone, and he can just talk. So this is this is mostly a monologue, <laughs> but the greatest monologue you'll hear because Mitchell is such a great storyteller, and also his stories are amazing. So just. Buckle up is all I got to say about this one. Yeah, I mean, I think we get probably a, a, across these two episodes, we probably each get in 10 words, maybe. Probably, probably. <laughs> Charles didn't quite know what he was getting into. I, I did, and I, I so I, I think I was more prepared for this. And uh, But I think by the end of it, Charles was having a good time. Oh, no, just... of course I was. He has, he, has, he has crazy stories, and it's definitely, you know, he'll give you a lot of backstory at first, but it gets more and more exciting. Stick with it because it's really funny. And I mean, that his description of meeting Tom Cruise for the first time is so funny. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just loved it. We, we, again, this is in celebration of the 20th anniversary of MI2. Uh, we wanted to have uh, some some good MI2 context. We haven't done a lot on this show. And so this is uh, this is giving all, all the Swanbecks out there what they need. Yeah, I mean, this was the last time. Well, really, this is the only time in the franchise history that a soundtrack album accompanied the movie and was like a sensation. The rest were basically score albums. You know, they had the the U2 version of the theme song on the first album. Although I guess the first album did have like a compilation because there was like Cranberries and some other stuff. But this was the big one. This one sold, I think, over a million copies and they never attempted it again, which is sort of weird that... They've never tried anything like this again, but I think it was just like the right time, right place. All these bands are very 2000s era, um, so it's kind of fun to go back there. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for everybody to hear it. Yeah, so uh, put on your seatbelt and uh, get ready get ready uh, for Mitchell's amazing stories and uh, enjoy Kevin Blumenfeld's uh, legally... Uh, incriminating? Plot theme. <laughs> Okay.
Okay, Mission Impossible 2 soundtrack. Woo! <laughs> Mitchell, do you want to tell people like what you what you do for a living and and what you did for the Mission Impossible 2 sure. soundtrack? Sure. Um, I am currently employed as president of music and soundtracks for Walt Disney Studios. Um, live action motion picture group, um, which um, entails anything live action at the studio. Um, the the Mission Impossible Two soundtrack um, I produced when I had just come back to Disney in um, ninety five. I had been at Disney originally from uh, eighty four to ninety as director in the music department. Uh, working for a great guy named Chris Montan, and uh, who was really a, a tremendous mentor for me and taught me so much. And then I, after the Pretty Woman soundtrack, I had a number of soundtracks in a row that were just gigantic. Um, Good Morning Vietnam, Beaches with Bette Midler, Cocktail, um, and then culminating with Pretty Woman. And it became so big that EMI Records offered me a gig as head of A&R. Um, for West Coast DMI, and that was the job I always wanted. I didn't really want to be in the film music business. I kind of fell into that and uh, went to EMI, um, bumped around there a little bit, jumped around a couple of jobs, and then ended up coming back to Disney in 1995 um, as um, SVP of soundtracks for the Disney Music Group, which really at the time, it was Hollywood Records was uh, scrapping away, trying to sign artists, um, taking on contemporary soundtracks. And Walt Disney Records was really just consumer products. And um, at the time that I went back to Disney in 95 and was heading up the soundtrack area, you would never make a movie in branded Disney. We had Touchstone. We right. had... Because the Disney, you know, it just, it just wasn't working as a brand of entertainment for feature films. So there were a lot of touchstone films. And so it was in my capacity of head of soundtracks, oddly, for Disney's record companies that I made a deal with Paramount Pictures, a competitor of Disney's, to acquire and produce the Mission Impossible 2 soundtrack. And that kind of came on the heels of... Um, well, it's a long story. I don't know how deep you want to go into these things. How much oh, you, you want, want me to, to ramble? Like, yes, you, know, you want yes, me to just ramble? Okay, I'll give you. I'll give you the <laughs> rambling. I'll give you the. I'll, I'll give you the total rambling. The authentic, historic rambling because I don't believe. Yes. I don't believe in editing history. Um, <laughs> so, um, so here I, I left this phenomenal job. I worked for this incredible. He was the. He, he was the richest. He had the richest deal in Hollywood as an independent producer. He was a, he's a guy named Arnon Milshan, and he's an Israeli um, national, and he's a producer, and he also, funny enough, has the distinction of being the man who gave Israel its first nuclear triggers. A very very interesting story. Very interesting background to this guy. Um, but I was working for Regency and I did movies like Natural Born Killers, JFK, um, Free Willy. I did a deal with Michael Jackson. And, and anyways, when I, when, I, when I broke that contract to go back to Disney, because I was very fond of Disney, they were finally offering me kind of a position that I felt I was entitled to. And I really thought I was destined to kind of take over the music group there. So I went back to Disney in 95 as head of soundtracks. At the time... Um, I thought I was going to be ruler of the world. I was going to do all the Disney soundtracks. And that was the basis for which they brought me back. Joe Roth and Chris Montana was still kind of knocking around the place. Well, when I got there, I got there right at a time when Joe Roth made a change in the music department. Again, I went to the record companies to be head of soundtracks because Hollywood Records was so hated intercompany at the time by its current managers that they at least wanted to bring some kind of semblance of, of responsibility and normalcy and to instill some confidence in the Disney filmmakers and movies they were making so that they at least wanted a soundtrack guy who was responsible, who was respected. So they brought me over there to do that. 
But when I got there, I found this incredible climate of just dysfunction within Hollywood Records by the management. And there was a new head of music at Disney, a woman named Kathy Nelson, who if you know anything about Kathy Nelson, she's one of the great heads of music of all times, maybe has sold more soundtracks, had more hits from movies than anyone I've ever known. Again, was a mentor to me in the sense that she was always going for it, but she hated Hollywood records. Not me, personally, we have a great relationship. She hated Hollywood records because she was promised that she was gonna get to take over the record company, but that didn't happen. So now she's head of music. Every time a big project came up, Armageddon, um, for example, she would find an, obviously, because Hollywood records never had any artists and what drives soundtracks, it's big hit singles and such. Well, if you're borrowing that artist, then the label that is lending you that artist has all the leverage. So she would always go after the biggest artists in the world at the time. And in borrowing them, the label would say, well, look, we'll give you Aerosmith to do this Diane Warren song, Don't Want to Miss a Thing, for Aerosmith, but you can't have the soundtrack. We have to have the soundtrack. And Kathy would then use that with Joe Roth, who was running the studio and the filmmakers. They'd go, oh my God, we want Aerosmith so bad. Hollywood Records can't give us anything. Sorry, Mitch, you can't have the, the Armageddon soundtrack. Sorry, Mitch, you can't have the up close and personal soundtrack because we got we got the, the, Celine Dion doing the song. Sorry, Mitch, you can't have the Phenomenon soundtrack because we want Eric Clapton to do this Baby Space song. And so I'm sorry. Oh, but bitch, you can have the sixth man, the fucking sixth man. You can have the sixth man soundtrack, <laughs> of course. So now all of a sudden, now all of a sudden I'm getting the garbage. By the way, I guess I should watch my, my language because I don't know who your listener is or who your fan is. No, you can, you can go. You can I can, go off. I can, yeah. I can yeah. drop the F-bomb every now and then yes. because oh, yes. Oh, yes. damn, it's appropriate so often. <laughs> um, but... You know, yeah, you can have this shitty soundtrack, Mitch. Yeah, of course, do this one. Touchstone Films, yeah, do that one. But anyways, so now all of a sudden, I gave up a job that I loved for with Arnon. I broke his heart by leaving him. Now I'm back at Disney, a company that I love where I'd spent five years. Now I'm back. Holy shit, the head of music isn't gonna give me the best soundtracks? What the hell am I gonna do? And I, and I said, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get really competitive. I'm gonna approach the other studios in the business who have movie businesses, but do not have aligned music divisions. So like Sony always had Sony, Universal always, you know, Warner's always had, and so, all right, who are the, who are the film companies that don't have a record affiliation? Ah, Paramount. So I go, I, so I started forging a relation with Paramount and a phenomenal, phenomenal head of music there who was responsible for me getting um, Mission Impossible 2, a wonderful guy named Harlan Goodman. And Harlan Goodman was the best. And he and I just had this phenomenal relationship. And what I did was I just started doing every soundtrack that guy wanted to do because Hollywood Records was so desperate for product. And this was in a time when soundtracks sold. So the more soundtracks that I could pick up for just the cost of releasing them, the more soundtracks I could pick up that I predicted would do 25,000 units, the more that would pop out and do 50,000 units, 75,000 units. So I started creating this big business of revenue of soundtracks through Hollywood Records from all sources of all over the place. And one of the sources was Paramount and my relationship with Harlan. So I started by just doing score albums. And then that led to, I was always one of those who, because I came from the film business, I didn't need a heck of a lot of, and I was desperate for product and I was well funded because I'm the Disney record company. So I was well funded. Um, so I, I was not one of those who needed a lot of, thought process behind whether I wanted to acquire a particular soundtrack or not. I'm a very gut instinct type of person. I roll by my gut. Um, I'm, I'm what Malcolm Gladwell calls a thin slicer. Um, and, um, and so I got into this rhythm with Paramount and one day they called me and said, Hey, look, you know, we've got this 
we've got this movie called Varsity Blues, and it's about Texas football. And we, uh, we got to be honest with you, Mitch. We've shopped it all over town, and we can't find anybody who wants to do this record. They don't think the movie's very good. And I said, well, just give me a little background on the movie. Who's the director? Oh, it's this guy, Brian Robbins. Okay, well, and, and here's the thing. You know, it is an MTV movie. I'm like, wait a minute. Varsity Blues is branded an MTV movie and like Van Toffler and all those guys at MTV. This The year was, um, call it, uh, nine, God, what year was Varsity Blues? Maybe 97, 98, something like that. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is an MTV movie? I'm guaranteed to get heavy rotation on any video I produce? I don't give a fuck if the movie is any good or not. I'm gonna sell records here. Yes, I'll pay, I'll take Varsity Blues. I did Varsity Blues, I put together this great soundtrack, I had Green Day, I did a Green Day video, I had, you know, uh, at the time, th Three Eye Blind, I had, uh, you know, like the who's who of that moment. And right out of the gate with Paramount, I have a gold record. Oh my God, Mitch, this is phenomenal. Like, um, listen, you know, um, um, look, we have another troubled movie. It's this kind of urban movie called Save the Last Dance. And, you know, we've shopped it all over town and like the labels that are in the urban business think it's a fake movie. They, you know, they don't really see it as a urban movie. And like, what, like, would you consider doing this one? And I'm like, who's in it? Um, well, it's a bunch of people you don't know, but we do have this little white actress, you know, it's basically an interracial love story. I said, wow, I really like that. Who's in it though? It's this girl, Julia Stiles. Not, not many people know her. And I'm like, Julia Stiles? I did 10 Things I Hate About You. I sold a half a million records. She's my good luck charm. I, I'll do Save the Last Dance. And they're like, Mitch, don't you even want to see the movie? I'm like, just show me a trailer. I'm sitting in the head of marketing's office, this great guy named Arthur Cohen. Show me a trailer. They showed me the trailer. It's an interracial love story about dance about teaching each other dance. And I'm like, I am in. I pick up Save the Last Dance. It ends up being after the fact branded an MTV movie. I sell 3 million records, okay? Wow. I am now Paramount's golden boy. Paramount is my meal ticket. <laughs> I'm now getting offers from all over town. I, I pick up and I acquire and produce the first Austin Powers soundtrack. Okay, that I sell a million and a half records on. Michael Eisner, who's the then chairman of, of Disney, calls me up one day and he says, Mitch, I'm completely confused. Why are these other film companies that are competitors giving you their soundtracks? And this is just, I don't get it. I just, everybody hates Hollywood records. We have no success in the artist business. We're a completely unstable entity. You're picking up records from a competitors for a broken label. Explain this to me. <laughs> and so, you know, I did the best I could to explain it to him and he still didn't get it. He's like, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. It's working, it's working, it's working. So um, I get a call from Rob Friedman, who was then the co-chairman of the company with Harlan Goodman on the home, the head of music. And he, they call up and he says, How'd you like to do Mission Impossible 2? And I'm like, in. And they're like, don't you want to know anything about it? What do you need to know about it? It's Tom Cruise, the biggest movie star in the world. And it's a brand. And they said, well, you know, it's tricky. Tom is very demanding. He's, he's you know, it's all Tom's baby. He actually owns the franchise. So... You, the ups and downs of this thing, it's going to be kind of crazy, but he does want a soundtrack. Here's the other thing you got to know up front. This is an action movie. I mean, it, I don't even, we don't even know if the movie's going to take songs, but he wants a soundtrack because it. Tom wants it to be cool for teenage boys it's an endorsement of the movie. He knows he needs to, he knows the franchise is getting a little older, that he's getting a little older. He he needs the equity that's going to attract teen males. And, but there's no songs in the, I'm like, I get it, I got it. It's an inspired by record. And they're like, an inspired by record? What's an inspired by record? I said, it's an inspired by record. It's music <laughs> from an inspired by. 
okay? Uh, and Inspired by Record is songs that are created and curated according to the brand that is the movie. And I'll tell you something else, man. I'll do something amazing with that theme, okay? I'll do something amazing with that theme. On the first film, you got the two dudes from U2 and you did the instrumental version. What a waste of life. I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna turn it into a real record. I'm gonna use that as the music bed and interpolate it, but I'm gonna find a great artist, a great producer. I'm gonna turn it into a great record. And so they said, wow, man, these are some phenomenal ideas. Let us talk to Tom about it and we'll come back to you. Like less than a day later, I get the call from those guys like, shit, man, Tom, Tom loves what you're saying. He, 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 he likes what you're saying. He thinks you get the whole thing. He'd like to meet with you. And I'm like, holy fuck, wait, you're telling, I'm going to meet with Tom Cruise? Like, wait, what? <laughs> and they said, and they said, yeah, you're going to meet with Tom Cruise. But here's the thing. Um, you got to go to Australia. And I'm like, wait. I'm going to go to Australia and meet with Tom Cruise. <laughs> and they're like, man, is there anything that these guys were like, is there anything that we can tell you that's discouraging? <laughs> and I'm like, no. Uh, when do you need me there? Well, he'd actually, it's Thursday. He'd like to meet with you Monday. Wait, I'm going to jump on an airplane Friday to fly to Australia to meet with Tom Cruise on Monday? <laughs> Let me get my passport. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> so um, Harlan Goodman and I um, jump on a plane. We fly to um, Australia. We're staying at this beautiful uh, Ritz Carlton in, um, oh God, what was the bay called? Deer Bay? Uh, it'll come to me. We check into the hotel room. Tom arranged, Tom chose the hotel that we were staying at. And he chose it because him and Nicole's house at the time was in this bay and the hotel was located by that. And the thing about Tom Cruise is, man, when he's in, he's in 1,000%. He is not, this is not a fringe guy. He's either in 1,000% or he's not in. And when he gets in, he's curating everything, okay? He's curating what hotel you're staying at. So we check into this Ritz Carlton. I've got this mega suite. It's like unbelievable. I'm being treated like royalty. I and you know I get room service one day, and this is this is kind of a I digress a little bit. But the 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 guy who c comes up brings me my room service. I'm like, let me ask you something. Why did I end up in this giant suite? And he said, well, not a lot of people stay in the suite here. I'm like, why not? It's the most beautiful thing. Well, it's got a bit of a weird history. I'm like, oh, uh, what's the what's the weird history? And he said, you see that door over there? I'm like, yeah. And that doorknob? Uh, yeah. That's where Michael Hutchins hung himself. This is where- What? Oh my God. Yeah, this is where the, he hung himself on the doorknob that was close to this. It's like, a, it was a two story elevation suite and, this one closet door opened and kind of hung over, came close to the edge. And yeah, Michael from In Excess, um, I guess put a belt wow. around his neck and hung him. And I'm like, oh God, man, really? You're kidding me? Wow. Like what a buzz killer. Like what a buzz kill. And, and they're like, but uh, we're telling you, it's the nicest room in the hotel. And I'm like, you know what? Okay, I'll get, over, I'll get, I'll get over it. Anyways, I digress. So. Monday comes around, car comes, picks me and Harlan up. We go to um, the production offices. They're on the Fox lot. Um, Fox owns this, well now Disney, owns this incredible production facility in Australia. Um, and uh, I go there, I'm starting to get a little nervous to be honest with you. I'm like, shit, I gotta meet Tom Cruise. Oh God, don't blow it. You know, uh, and so we get into this production thing and we're kibitzing with a bunch of people and um, we're waiting and it's like, look, Tom, you know, when he says he's, we're going to meet, you know, because he's on the set shooting and we're not taking you right to the set. He wants to meet first. You know, it, we could look, it might be half an hour. It might be three hours. I'm like, look, I'm here for you guys, whatever it is. Uh, Harlan, let's shoot a game of pool. So we're shooting a game of pool and, um, it's these production offices where you enter these production off. They're just big gutted stages of sorts. 
you enter from this door that's on the parking lot and then you come walking into the production offices and that's and the pool table's right there the pool table kind of is at the end of this long walk in and then it's this big spatial place with all these people and little cubes working in private offices and so i'm shooting a game of pool with with uh, harlan and i'm kind of lined up and I'm at the edge of pool table, kind of looking across the long way of the pool table down the long hall and there's the door that leads out to the parking lot and I'm lining up this shot and all of a sudden the door pops open and this figure, okay, it's very brightly lit and, the, and, and, the, and I'm looking down this long hall and I can't really make out who it is, but there's, there's this figure walking towards me. It's, it's kind of like perfectly apropos for Easter. It's, it looks like, like Jesus backlit and like this glow of, of light. And you can't really even, <laughs> I can't make out who it is, but it's this glowing, <laughs> it's this glowing being walking towards us. And I'm like, and like I've got the stick, and I'm not even really. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and and the figure isn't that tall, and he, but the, but it's long hair, and and it's coming towards me, and it's coming towards me, and I all of a sudden realized, oh my god, that's Tom. Oh my god, that's Tom. <laughs> okay, I'm saying this in my head, and he's walking towards me, 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 and he walks around the pool table, and he walks right up to me. He's never seen me in his life. He walks right up to me, gets right in my face, sticks out his hand, and says, you're Mitchell Lieb, right? And I'm like, oh my God, Tom, like, like how you doing? It's fantastic to meet you. You know, I start bumbling and he's just, he makes you feel like you are the only person in the world. He has, and like, look, you know, was I a Tom Cruise fan? Am I a Tom Cruise fan? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I like Top Gun. Yeah, I thought the first Mission Impossible movie, yeah. You know, but I don't think he's the, you know, I'm thinking in my mind, he's not the greatest actor. You Like, I was trying to convince myself so I wouldn't be intimidated. And here I am. He <laughs> walks right up to me. He knows who I am. And it was one of those moments of like, man, in this world, there are people who have it. And you're trying to describe what it is. And you really can't put your finger on it. But... Tom Cruise has it, he is it, and he owned me from that moment on, okay? <laughs> I, 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 am, I am not gay, um, but at that moment, man, I would, I would have swung <laughs> that way because this guy is something. This guy is something. Uh, well, and so anyways, um, I met him. We sat down and kind of talked philosophically about it. And he was just a cheerleader. He was simply, I love all of your ideas. I love where you're coming from. Just go for it. Just go for it. So that's the setup. What would you like to know beyond that? <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I think how, how did you start like putting this together? Obviously, I think the Metallica song and the Limp Bizkit song are the song everybody remembers, yeah. but... Rob Zombie is on this yeah. soundtrack and there's a whole bunch of like, how did you sort of start putting it together? Um, it did really begin with uh, the first thing that Tom really locked into was my idea of trying to turn the theme. He was very concerned that there was nothing more that could be done with the theme and that, you know, cause Larry and uh, what's his name had done it for the first movie. Um, that there was really nothing that could be done with it. And yet he knows that it's the iconic calling card of the franchise. So he was very intrigued with my confidence that I could do something big with it. And so the first thing we really started with was that long before, I mean, I, I did, I, I, I think I, what I accomplished in Australia in that first meeting with Tom was number one, we were going to go for it and I was going to spend millions of dollars to chase it. And he loved okay. it and he loved that. Number two was my first priority was going to be really trying to develop this idea of um, turning the theme into a real record, into a, a vocal record. Okay. And um, number three was, I cemented in them 
understanding what the um, agenda was in wanting to bolster the male audience, including the aggressive, you know, the younger teenage and, and a little bit more mature than that audience um, in males, that I, I was hell-bent that it had to be rock. It had to substantially be a rock record. Um, because I felt that hip hop, though hip hop, of course, was dominating in so many ways. This was still when rock mattered. This is still when a number one K-Rock mattered. A number one record in K-Rock, a number one K-Rock record mattered. And you could sell records on the backs of that and get a ton of radio play nationally. It still mattered. And um, those were really the, the those were really the anchors of the conversation that I walked away um, and left Australia with was that I had Tom support. I was gonna throw down in a gigantic way. I was gonna focus specifically on initially, cause I had plenty of time, cause they were still shooting. It was, it was a ways away before we would ever be thinking about the release and everything. And that we were, that I was gonna be very focused on having it be a hard hitting rock record. Okay, Tom signed off on all of those things. And then I went to work and really what I did was I seeded everybody I knew. I'm not, I, I believe in um, like, look, I can do a lot of things for a lot of people and I'm a great idea guy, but what I can't do is write the song. What I can't do is be the artist. And so uh, what I did was I seeded and sent around multiple versions of just the Mission Impossible theme, the Lalo Schifrin instrumental theme. And I seeded it with songwriters and producers and artists and managers and A&R people. I just went deep and wide with it. And what I, you know, look, to get the industry's attention sometimes, and I love, and I still play this game today, I have loved working at Disney. One of the big reasons I've loved being a Disney executive is I've got a very deep checkbook. And if you wanna get attention from the biggest of artists, you gotta wink, wink, hint, hint that you're playing on that level and that you can afford them in the first place and that you're not gonna compromise and that you're basically bringing them the biggest movie with the biggest movie star with the biggest budget willing to make the biggest video wanting the biggest splash. And people respond to that. So I went out deep with the instrumental themes and I got a great friend who's still my friend today, uh, a manager named Jeff Quantnitz. And Jeff Quantnitz uh, had a business called The Firm and was one of the first uh, managers to kind of consolidate management companies into one and then try and diversify. Ultimately, The Firm, which made a lot of money for a while, ended up not lasting, Irving, Azoff is the one who perfected the, the kind of notion of um, consolidating individual managers and management companies into one under one giant umbrella for the good of all. And, uh, but Jeff Quantnitz, who at the time managed Limp Biscuit, and Limp Biscuit had just broken gigantic. I mean, they were, they were big because they were rocking rap. You know, he, he was taking advantage of the rap culture, but it was the skate rap. It was the skate rap kind of thing. The gritty, stupid skate rap, skate rap <laughs> and mixing it with rock. And um, Jeff Quantitz came to me and said, dude, do you mind if I give this to Limp Biscuit? I mean, this is right up his alley. And he loves the Mission Impossible franchise. He is, the, he is Tom Cruise's biggest fan. Like, do you mind if I slip it to Fred Durst? And I said, no, of course, listen, anybody and everybody. And so, you know, a couple of weeks go by and I start getting stuff in and I'm listening to stuff and there's some interesting takes. I think I had everybody from the Chemical Brothers to, and somewhere in archives at Disney, I've got demos and 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 demos of artists and producers who, we're gonna we're gonna need to listen to these. Yeah, the, uh, I'll, I'll yeah. dig them out. I'll we're dig them out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, demos everywhere. And um, Jeff Quantitz calls me up and says, "Oh my God, Fred crushed it. He killed. You gotta hear this. Come over to my office. I'm gonna play you something." 
And I went over to his office and he put on, it was just the instrumental version, but he put on pretty much the Limp Biscuit record of Take a Look Around that you hear that that starts with the haunting and then the drum beat. And he incorporated like it was it was unbelievable. So much so that like so he gives me a cassette of it, a CD of it, I don't remember, but uh, so, you know, um, now at Hollywood Records, since I had joined, rejoined, there had been a changeover in upper management. So now there was a guy named Bob Cavallo, who was now heading the record companies. And Bob had brought in his son, Rob Cavallo, who's a tremendous producer. I mean, a tremendous producer, Green Day, Goo Goo Dolls, Alanis Morissette, you know, really one of the great Grammy award-winning producer of the year. Tremendous, tremendous producer. Um, he was head of A&R. I didn't report to him, but because Rob was such a hit maker and, and that, you know, Bob was always like, hey, Mitch, you know, play that. Because I, when I got this Limp Bizkit thing, uh, the instrumental track, I was like, oh my God, I played it for Bob. And Bob's like, I don't know, yeah, play it for my son, um, which was Bob's biggest strength. Um, and so I played it for Rob and Rob was like, oh my God, wow, you've really got something here. I can't wait to see what he does with the top line. Well, soon after, man, Fred delivers the top line with the verses. I know what you want to hate me. Like, oh, and, and, and at Hollywood Records at the time, a great guy, Mark Didia, was our head of marketing and promotion. Joey Scaleri, Vendetta, who's got a show debuting this weekend in Canada, sports show. I, we had the greatest staff, and these guys were so hungry. And Didia was so tapped into K Rock. And um, so Fred delivers this record, and it's like, oh my God. And I'm playing it for people, and they are like, this is going to change the, like, you know, like, oh, this is going to change everything. And, um, <laughs> and, and I play, and I play it for the Paramount people and they're like, oh my God, this is, this is phenomenal. But like, look, we can't, you got to play it for Tom. You got to go play it for Tom. So I go back to Australia. What? <laughs> to do nothing but to play it for Tom. Okay? So I fly back to Australia. This time I meet with Tom in his hotel room. Um, of course, he's got a mega stereo okay, in his hotel room. I put this thing on. To Tom's credit, he, this guy turns, like, tops out his volume knob. <laughs> we rock to it. Well... I'm rocking to it. I, you know, I'm one of those. I listen to music and I'm doing this. Okay. And I'm not really thinking. And I open my eyes and I just see Tom doing this. Kind of quietly listening to this rock record at 11 <laughs> volume. And he's just doing this. And I'm like, shit. Does he get it? Does he not like it? Oh, fuck. You know, wait a minute. Like, oh, God. I hope I don't have a confrontation over this because... This is this is going to be the biggest thing. And um, so it ends. And it was just one of those. He looks up at me and he goes, exquisite. <laughs> no, no, really. This is this is more than I could ever have imagined. You you've done it. You 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 did. It's it was not a excite like me. When I'm excited, you feel that excitement. And it was a bit strange because he's he's so magnanimous and he's so, and you would expect he would be a guy that would jump out of his skin. And his response was totally supportive, talking about how much he loved it, but it was very kind of strangely reserved, okay? And I really didn't think about that at the moment, but then when I came to learn way down the line is, he doesn't really understand hard rock. Okay, he does. He doesn't understand. That's not where he comes from. That's not what he listens to. He doesn't understand hard rock. He was wise enough and smart enough 
to hear that we had stood this theme on end, okay? So he said, let me live with it. When are you going back? I said, well, I was gonna go back tomorrow. He said, can you stay for a couple of days? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, I'll call you when I'm ready. Okay, great. So he he goes off to live with it. Now I'm sitting there and like, um, geez, now that I think about it, is this gonna be an hour? Is it gonna be a day? What, what am I supposed to do? And you know, I'm told just sit by the phone basically <laughs> for a couple of days. So um, I sat by the phone. He ended up calling about two days later and he said, I love it. You've done it. Bravo. But I'd like, is there any way that I can talk to Fred about some lyric changes? I said, lyric changes? Like, like this is this is awesome. What do you, what what lyric changes? Well, I don't think he should say, basically, now I know why you want to hate me. Now I know why you want to hate me, because hate is all that's in the world today or whatever. I, I, I got to go back and look at the lyric of that song to, under, to remember. But it was, the, it was that line and that phrase. Now I know why you want to hate me. And I'm like, oh, I think he's, I said, I think he's playing on it. I mean, look, you know, Ethan Hunt is like the... You know, he's always fighting the system. He's he's be, he's going against the system. And I think that's what it is. It's a commentary on the system hating him, the system wanting to shut him down. Who can you trust? It's all of those things. And he said, yeah, yeah, I, I know still, I, I, I want a lyric change. And I'm like, oh God, this is gonna be a nightmare. Okay, let me get back to LA. Let me see how to get Fred Durst. Let me, let me figure this out. I go back to LA. Soon after, uh, I, I go to Quantnitz, I tell him, hey, Tom wants to talk about the lyric. Um, Fred says, hey, I'm, I'm happy to talk about the lyric. When can I, can I meet Tom? Uh, yeah, let me, let me, you know, now I'm doing the middle, the middle ground of this, the back and forth. And um, soon after that, they wrapped production in Australia and they came back to LA to do additional stage shooting at that LA Central Studios there and kind of downtown LA, there's a giant film production facility. And it's where Tom shot that sequence where he, uh, if you remember from the movie, where he drops down on that line down into the, uh, yeah. almost into the smoking gas thing and d does whatever he does. So they moved back there and it gave me the opportunity to grab Fred and go over to meet with Tom in the trailer in between takes. And um, so Fred came down, we went into the trailer, listened to the song, and that's when, so Fred said, so uh, what, what lyrics exactly do you wanna, what, do you wanna talk about? And Tom says, well, it's this, I know why you wanna hate me. I really, that doesn't sit well with me. I'd like you to change that. Hate is all that's in the world today. That's not really what the movies are. I, I, I'd like you to change that. And Fred's like, oh, that's my favorite part of the song. I'm not changing that. <laughs> <laughs> so now I got like I got the I got the biggest movie star in the world and I have an artist who's one of the hottest artists in the world right now and they're not seeing eye to eye. So we kind of have the conversation and Tom realizes that he's not going to be able to change his mind right then and there and Fred realizes he's not going to be able to change Tom's mind right there and we just kind of agree for the moment to just kind of break and and we'll kind of think about it and say goodbye. I walked Fred out. I assured Fred that I thought it was genius and that I was gonna work on Tom to just sign off on it because it was too fabulous. And I'd already played for Paramount. They were gonna use it in spots. And um, and Tom, um, you know, kind of Tom to his credit, took a couple more shots at it. And I, and I kept talking him through why it wasn't gonna work. And then I validated that we had played it for Kevin Weatherly, who was the programmer for, K-Rock and that I could assure him that it was gonna be a number one K-Rock record and that that Tom should just basically get out of the way. Um, and Tom, uh, listen, Tom is a very smart business guy. And I think when he sized everything up and realized what it was and he said, okay, he said, okay, got it. I'm not gonna, uh, I'm fine with the lyric. And he said, I'll tell you something else. I figured out, Tom said this to me, I had no expectation any of the songs were gonna make it in the movie. I thought it was an inspired by record. I thought that was the end of it. Tom said, I also got an idea of how I'm gonna put it in the film. And it was like, are you kidding? Now I've got music from and inspired by. 
okay, which is a whole other thing when you can actually sell a soundtrack with any type of honest placements of any of the material in the film. So um, now we were on a great path and starting to talk about music videos and, and the wheel started turning at Paramount with what we could do with things. And I realized, okay, now I've really got to get this record together. Uh, so I started just kind of like what would go with this. Um, I think I think I got in like um, I got in some anchors that I thought were important to the record that were existing, like Have a Cigar by, you know, Foo Fighters and Brian May, which is Taylor singing, if I remember that right. Um I think that got pitched to me. That was just an outtake from one of their records, a, a record that they had done that had never been released. So I, I really, it didn't matter to me whether or not the, the songs were created, because since it was an inspired by record and we didn't have to chase particular scenes in the movie, which is sometimes what requires needing to develop original material because you just can't find something that exists that fits brilliantly, or you just kind of want to make that statement of original. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't held back by that necessity of the movie. So to me, all that really mattered were great records by great artists so that I could build my marquee of important acts that were gonna be on the record. And so, you know, I ended up with a, a number of these tracks on the record are, uh, were existing tracks that I just kind of got in. They just kind of worked. Um, and I started compiling and compiling and compiling. During that time is when I approached Metallica because I was thinking what would be, what rock artist has never done an original song for a movie that would be a good, I was looking for a one-two punch. What, what is the most credible rock artist in the business who's never done an original song for a movie? And I kept coming back to Metallica and really couldn't figure out why. And then through some relationships. It's not that I had a, a, a huge relationship with Bernstein and Mensch, but I kind of knew them. They'd been around for a long time. And so I approached Bernstein and Mensch and pitched them the idea. And Lars, you know, who, I don't want to say Lars is the, the leader of Metallica, but certainly he, he was one of the original founders with James and calls a lot of the shots and is kind of the, the brand manager of, of the property. And, um, uh, Cliff and Peter talked to Lars and the next thing I knew they called me and said, hey, Lars wants to get on the phone and talk to you about this. He loves the Mission Impossible franchise. He, Tom Cruise is his favorite movie star. Um, he might very well, Metallica might very well want to do this. He'd like to talk to you. Okay, great. I did a phone call with Lars. We kind of talked through what I was doing. I think I played him over the phone, the Limb Biscuit thing, and he was blown away by it. I mean, that's really... At that moment in time, that Limp Biscuit record was a one listen record for agro rock and K rock. And that Fred just nailed it and it was the theme. So it had that familiarity, it had that equity of the theme having been turned into this big record. And so and, and that was a one listen record for anybody who listened to it. And Lars was impressed and he said, um, great, I'd like to come to LA. And of course, everybody wants to meet Tom. And now I'm the gatekeeper to Tom Cruise and Tom is treating me like gold. And so I called Tom and I said, hey, Lars from Metallica, they're the most important rock band in the world. Never done an original song for a movie. He wants to do a song. I don't want to be a middleman to give the wrong direction. I'd like you to meet with Lars. I'll bring him down to the Central Studios. We can do it in your trailer again. I think you'll enjoy meeting him. Um, let me bring him down and meet with him. And he's like, great, I'll do whatever you need me to do. Bring him. I brought, so Lars flies in. I go with Lars downtown. We go into Tom's trailer, just the three of us, just like with Fred. Um, and, uh, and we have this great conversation. And Tom just loved Lars. Lars told the story. Do you guys ever see Goodwill Hunting? 
you know, um, the the Matt Damon movie, yeah. and yeah. you know the you know the character Skyler who wants to go to medical school, and that's his girlfriend, and um, that character was Lars's first wife. Um, her name was Skyler. She was a med student. Tom loved the behind the scenes and 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 Tom did his homework on who Metallica was also, which really helped. Um, and they just hit it off, man. They just hit it off. And Tom said, I, you know, I just want a big, straightforward rock record from you guys. And actually had done his homework and cited a couple of Metallica records and... Lars said, great, I'm gonna go off and write you something awesome. And he went off and they came back with I Disappear, which actually ended up being, for even for Metallica, as big as they were, it was their first K-Rock number one hit. And oh, wow. um, yeah, so it, was, it, um, it obviously, as that was as we got down the line, and now all of a sudden, so now I've got Metallica, now I've got Limp Biscuit. Tom was really not paying attention to, because the songs that weren't in the movie, Tom really said he didn't care what else rounded out the record and that I should just kind of do what I do best and, um, and put together the best record that I possibly could. And so as these other tracks all came together, um, Tom was not really interested in hearing anything or anything else. He was very happy with what Limp Bizkit had done. That was now in the movie. He was very happy with Metallica, what Metallica had done. He put that in the movie as well. So now I've got, now I've got my two biggest songs in the film and my record company is going crazy thinking this is gonna be the biggest thing of all time and Paramount is ecstatic. And so I'm pulling these other tracks together and, uh, and the record's coming to, together beautifully. And now I finally have my first compilation assembled of what this record was going to be. And I sent it over to Tom to listen to. And it, he, he, listen, uh, the, the honest to God truth of it is he didn't get it. He didn't get it. Um, as you can see here, I always had it sequenced Limp Biscuit with the theme first going into Metallica. Of course, what am I gonna bury Metallica at the end of the, no. Um, I got my one-two punch. So he, Tom, man, once he got past Limp Biscuit and Metallica, you know, Rob Zombie, Scum of the Earth and Butthole Surfers and like the Pimps. And, and like, it's like, he, he, he it, it was God Smack and Uncle Cracker. And he, like, he, he just, he didn't get it. He did not get it. And... He was going to pull the plug. So get this. So records assembled. Um, Tom had always told me he didn't care. Just do what I did best. Put it together. He cared very much about Limp Bizkit and Metallica because those marketing things. And most filmmakers, most studios, that's all they really care about. They care about the... They care about the calling cards. They care about the things that are going to move the meters and get asses into the theaters opening weekend. And especially in this case, what Paramount was loving and what they cared most about was a K-Rock promotional campaign, Countdown, a national alternative rock uh, campaign, and the bolstering of this young male audience. That was all that mattered to them. I was delivering that to them, and they were ecstatic, but now they had an artist relations problem. That's it, part one. I hope you all survived. Uh, that is is just amazing. He's a great storyteller. Yeah. We also had much, I think we talked a lot longer than we were supposed to, too, but uh, it was worth it. It was worth it. He's, he's amazing. Yeah, and I think his contribution kind of can't be overstated. Like, he convinced Tom Cruise that it should be a rock soundtrack, and then that song was then put into the movie, and shaped the feel of that movie and the marketing of the movie and everything. When you think of that movie, you think about this music and that's, you know, Mitchell really did contribute a lot to the aesthetic of this movie in, in a crazy way. 
Yeah. I mean, there were major singles that came out of this. And I mean, it, it is a phenomenal, a phenomenal thing. And, and again, like a once a once in the franchise history thing, too. Because they never tried it again, so yeah, and oh, and I also, you know, sorry, uh, we should have opened with this, but uh, the it, it, we ended it on a cliffhanger. Mitchell's talking about how uh, the the music's uh, the album's not going to come out. Maybe Tom Cruise is going to stop this thing from coming out. So you got to come back next week and hear the conclusion of the story and how uh, a very prominent music supervisor from a very prominent director comes to the rescue. It's a it's a really fun story, and you gotta you gotta hear it. Please come back. I mean, it would be very disappointing if you just w- listened to this first part and just walked away. You know, that would be <laughs> that would be devastating. I think. But um, also the the demos, like they're demos from a bunch of artists. The only artist he named was Chemical Brothers, but we've got to find out who else did demos. Yeah, I, I fully intend on bugging Mitchell uh, when he goes back to work for us to go visit him at his office, which is also incredible. There's so much cool stuff on the walls and. Uh, yeah, he's he's got a really cool office at Disney. So we'll we'll be back, Mitchell. Don't worry, we're gonna find you. I I also wanted to just for the MI two twentieth anniversary, I wanted to plug this totally random thing. I'm I'm sure I've I've texted and I've bothered you about this a lot, Drew. But the uh, there's this guy who makes uh, Blu-rays, basically in his garage, I assume, um, and it, the his company is called Hong Kong Rescue, and he makes these. There there's so many great hong kong uh classics from the 80s that are sort of ignored and they don't have great transfers uh i mean thankfully there are some you know i know criterion just did uh police story one and two the jackie chan classics but there are a lot of them that haven't and and a couple of them that this guy hong kong rescue has done he's done hard-boiled and he's about to release the killer and so i just wanted to plug for any of you john woo fans out there if you haven't heard of hong kong rescue just Google Hong Kong Rescue. I think it'll come up. He's got a, a very basic website where you can just scroll through and look at all the titles he's done. He's, you know, he works kind of slowly, but I would get on his get, get it on his email list. He gives you these crazy updates on how he has been remastering these movies that are lost. You know, that only had a good laser disc release or only had a good DVD release in Japan or something, and he puts together. Uh, these movies and restores them and uh, you know he's done he's done a lot of Jackie Chan movies I mean I think he's only done maybe not even 10 titles yet they probably come out once every six months even but he is uh, about to release the killer he's done hard-boiled he's done uh, some other Jackie Chan classics like uh, Drunken Master 2 and Wheels on Meals and Project A uh, he did Armor of God. I mean, it's it's really cool. I, I, do you have any of his stuff, Drew? No. Why Why are you talking about this, though? That's my question. Because <laughs> of John Woo and the 20th anniversary of MI2. Oh, John Woo. Okay. Got it. Okay. John Woo. Anybody who loves MI2, they if you're a big MI2 fan, I assume you're an even bigger hard-boiled and the killer fan. And so you should get this. You should look this up. I wanted to plug this guy's work because he works really hard and he does really amazing stuff. And I, uh, I think people might be interested. All right. Well, I hope he gives us some money or something after this plug. That's my, <laughs> that's my hope. Well, okay. Speaking of which, uh, we should talk about our Patreon. It's uh, patreon.com slash light the fuse. Uh, if you want to contribute, we've got a lot of new Patreon members. We're very happy about that. Thank you so much for signing up. Uh, it it always it really helps our show. It makes it it makes it possible for us to be doing weekly episodes. Uh, we're doing all kinds of bonus episodes. We have a bonus interview with Mo Shafiq about the MI2 vinyl soundtrack release that Mondo is doing, um, and it's an expanded release. And it's a really exciting interview that we have with him. And uh, we've got all, all kinds of other things we always talk about, the commentaries. We're, we're going to do, a, a, this week, we're going to do a, a, a breakdown of why we love Die Hard with a Vengeance, because it's the 25th anniversary of Die Hard with a Vengeance. And uh, yeah, if you don't want to do the Patreon, you can always just uh, go to our Tee Public page, which is linked from our website, lightthefusepodcast.com. And from, from there, you go to our merch section, and then you'll see our, our Tee Public items, and you can go to the Tee Public page, and that's where we have shirts and magnets and pins and stickers. Uh, get one of those. That, that, that really helps us. Every dollar counts. Uh, thank you all so much for your support. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon, and it was mixed and edited by Luke Burson. And uh, what else, Drew? We got, uh, we got exciting stuff coming up in the, in the next few months. Um, no, I think you covered everything. I'm just excited for everybody to listen to part two next week. So we'll be back. And um, until then, please just tell people that you listen and tell them to listen. And it would be a big help however you get the word out.
Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcasts at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.